Mitchell Shaw is here tonight. He's a former uh, John Birch coordinator. And his three big things are faith, faith, and freedom. He has studied this for uh, quite a while. This is his topic. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. Uh, when I took some uh, speaking classes uh, a few years ago in college, they taught us the three pumps of public speaking. He said, stand up so you can be seen, speak up so you can be heard, and then shut up so you can be enjoyed. So I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can, but we've got some pretty important information to cover tonight. Uh, and it reminds me, some, some folks remind me a little bit of the uh, fellow who uh, his neighbor came to him to ask him, hey, can I borrow your lawnmower? Mine's broken and my grass is growing up. I said, you know what, I would let you, but my wife's making spaghetti tonight. And the neighbor said, Spaghetti, what does that got to do with me borrowing your lawnmower? He said, well, nothing, but if I don't want to lend you my lawnmower, one excuse is just as good as another. <laughs> so I, I think I'm in a room full of people who are nothing like that. You folks have taken the time and the effort to hear one side of the issue, and now you're taking the time and the effort to hear the other side of it because regardless of where we come down on this, we, this is pretty heavy, heavy stuff. I think we all know that this is... Um, one way or the other going to impact the direction that our country is going to go for many generations. And so we need to keep that in mind. I'm a bit of a word nerd, I believe, in defining my terms. So let's talk for a second about the problem. Politics. Let's break that word down for a second. Poly comes from the Greek. It means of many or many kinds. Ticks. Well, we all know those are blood-sucking uh, parasites. Politics, many blood sucking parasites. I think we found the problem. Um, no elected officials in the room that decided. Uh, there's a difference between, by the way, and I, I, I used that uh, introduction once when I was uh, introducing uh, Senator Randy Brogdon, who was a state senator in Oklahoma, and a real statesman. And I got to the punchline, and he stands up and says, Mitch, this is my introduction. And I said, I want to introduce you tonight to a man who doesn't fit that definition. There's a difference between a politician and a statesman. All statesmen are probably politicians, but not all politicians are statesmen. And what we need are people of integrity holding these offices, abiding by the text of the Constitution as it's written. So the question is, well, Mitch, if we're not going to have a convention of states or an Article 5 convention or, or whatever, what are we going to do? And so I'll go ahead and, and steal my own thunder just for a moment. Let's look at Dave Bratt's campaign. How did he unseat Eric Cantor, who was ensconced? How did that happen? Because people got off their butts and knocked on doors and picked up phones. You didn't just write checks and wait for somebody else to do it. You put on your walking shoes and you got the job done. How many of you were at the debate in Northern Virginia just uh, last week to hear Michael Ferris debate uh, along with Bob Marshall on this issue? Mr. Ferris, uh, toward the end of the evening, said that just trying to elect the right people doesn't work. And I know this because I've knocked on more doors than probably everybody in this room, he said. And I thought, well, he, he's this close to the real solution. One person knocking on a million doors is one person. You're finite. You're limited. How about a million people knocking on a thousand doors? Nobody's got to set the world on fire all by themselves. Just make phone calls. Find that man or woman of integrity that has a record of holding to the line where the Constitution is concerned and work your guts out to get people like that in office. Not writing checks and going back to whatever's on the tube but actually working toward a solution to the problem. So I'm going to hand out something here. Um, if anybody wants more information, we've got some handouts that I expect everybody here to take as many of those as, uh, as we have out. And make sure that you're educating yourself about this, because obviously I, I can't cover everything in the limited amount of time we're going to have tonight. If you would like more information, uh, please pass this around. And everyone, uh, just give us your email address. It's the only way we make any money. We sell these to Google. No. <laughs> it's going to be more information about the content that we're covering tonight. Okay, so 
feel free so that you know whether you want more information. Uh, you know, or, or, or pass it around to everybody who already knows that you're going to want more information. Go ahead and fill that out. And then anybody left over, it will be on the table when we're done. It just, just, you know, we want your email address so that we can send you some follow-up articles in the future as this thing moves forward. So let's go ahead and get started. The Amendments Convention, Solution or Seduction. Uh, and I want to be very clear, by the way, before I really get, let me be clear. Um, <laughs> before I really get started, I want to say uh, I do not accuse any individual on the other side of this issue of being an enemy, of being uh, lacking integrity, having nefarious or, or whatever other agendas. I just simply say they're wrong about the data. And people are wrong for a variety of reasons. Sometimes people are wrong because they've already bought into something and their pride won't let them reverse their position. Sometimes people are wrong because it fits a preconceived idea. I mean, you guys are going to open up your email boxes when you go home tonight. How many forwards are going to be in there? And do we all already know that Facebook changed their security settings and it's not going to eat your children? Okay. But you're going to get a, a, a box full of forwards from well-meaning people that saw this. It fits an idea they already kind of buy into. So they forward it along because they want to help people. And they don't take the time to do due diligence and find out that, wait, there's a little more to it than that. And it takes you about three minutes doing a Google search or a Bing search, for those of you who use Microsoft products, um, to find out that well, there's really not that much to that and it's actually the other way around. So we're going to talk a little bit about information tonight. And I'm not going to be contentious. I'm not going to accuse the other side of being enemies of the Constitution. I'm not going to accuse the other side of lacking integrity. I'm simply going to say they're wrong and dangerously so. So let's talk about that. A constitutional convention uh, has been known uh, through a lot of different names, and, and there's a tactic of um, kind of uh, selling a product by a new name every now and again. So we're going to call it ConCon. Con. That's just short for constitutional convention. It's easier to write. It's easier to say. An amendments convention, a convention of states, or an Article 5 convention. Now, these are all phrases that refer to the same thing. And as one good woman said uh, over the issue of whether a convention of states is the same thing as a constitutional convention, she said, you know, when I got married, I changed my name, but I'm still me. So a name change is just a name change. When we look on the conservative side of this issue, because largely this is a, am I blocking anyone's view terribly? Okay. I'm going to step over and not block your view. So when we look at the, uh, the conservative side of this issue, because largely this has become a very conservative issue, we're going to see, uh, of course, Mark Levin's book, The Freedom Amendments, or Liberty, I'm sorry, Liberty Amendments. And then groups like Convention of States, Compact for America, Balanced Budget Amendment Task Force, Middle Resolution, a lot of tea parties. Nope. No Republican clubs, none of the Republican GOP groups have really gotten behind this. I think there's a reason for that. But we'll talk a little more about that. But what about the liberal, progressive, socialist, internationalist side of this issue? How many of those groups are advocating for the same thing? I'll have about Wolfpack, Alliance for Democracy, Center for Media and Democracy, Code Pink, Independent Progressive Politics Network, Progressive Democrats of America, uh, the Sierra Club, Vermont for Single Payer, MoveOn.org, Green Party, and the Occupy Movement all favor a convention of states, an Article 5 convention, because folks, they've got their agenda too. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, when state number 34 puts in a call for a constitutional convention, do we really think that the only people sitting down at that table are going to be Christian-oriented, conservative, Tea Party folk? The answer is no. So how do you control that? Let's take a look at the text of Article 5, which I have up here. Um, but it's so small and you can't see it, so I was, I was thoughtful, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you. I'm not going to put the entire text up there. I'm going to just use, we're going to talk about sections of it. But by the time we put all the sections together, it's the entire text. So let me read it to you. Exactly as it's written. And there's a reason I'm doing this, by the way. Um, 
child of the 70s, did most of my growing up in the 80s, I was born in 1970. And I remember the early 80s, uh, sugar frosted this and cocoa flavored that were really cutting into Kellogg's flagship product, corn flakes. Nobody was eating corn flakes. Well, you can't not have corn flakes. I mean, you're Kellogg's. So we got to get the interest back into this product. How do we do it? They launched a brilliant ad campaign. They showed a guy rooting through his cabinet, gal rooting through her cabinet, looking for, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of this. Corn flakes, I've not had that since. Pour a bowl of corn flakes, pour the milk on it, take a bite, thoughtful look, caption on the bottom. Corn flakes, taste them again for the first time. So, you know, we've all read the text of the Constitution. We've all read Article 5. But in the face of a whole bunch of arguments saying that Article 5 says this and Article 5 says that and this clause means this and that clause means that, let's take a look at the actual text of Article 5 because we're not liberals or progressives. We don't look at the text and wish something was there or read into it what we hope is there. We just look at the text and let it speak for itself. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the applications of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for the proposing of amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of the three-fourths of the several states or by conventions and three-fourths thereof, as one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no amendment which thou shall be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, dealing with slavery and the importation of, and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. That is the full text of Article 5. So now let's take a look at the different entities that are addressed in Article 5. We have state legislatures. We have Congress. And we have the convention itself. Now we're going to introduce others in a moment, but right now let's just look at those three entities. And then let's take a look at the text. The Congress, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. So, the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the states. Who calls for this? Who applies for it? The states. They have the power to apply. The Congress shall call a convention. Trick question. Who calls the convention? Congress. Congress calls the convention. The Congress, according to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, that beast of burden, by the way, the necessary and proper clause, says, the Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into, into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution. So if Article 5 says that Congress calls the convention, and Congress has the authority given to them by the Constitution to enact all laws and make rules for anything they're given power to do, who sets the rules for the convention? Congress. So Congress calls the convention and makes all laws for calling the convention. The convention, a convention for proposing amendments. Who proposes the amendments? The convention. The convention is called for the purpose of proposing amendments. So, the convention proposes the amendments, which shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states. So ratification method number one exists under the auspices of the state legislatures. They would either ratify it or not ratify it. Or, by conventions and three-fourths thereof, creating a new body, ratification conventions as one of the other method may be proposed by Congress. So Congress gets to choose the ratification method. They can either use state legislatures or create ratification conventions in each state as they did for the repeal of uh, prohibition, okay? Because they knew that the teetotaler states were never gonna go for it. As one of the other mode of ratification may be proposed by Congress, so again, a congressional power to select either ratification method number one or number two. Now, 
This is where most people think it's done. But let's look at precedent. In 1787, when our founders got together to address the issues that were faulty in the Articles of Confederation, and I know their opinions vary. I've read the Articles of Confederation. They were weak. They didn't create a country. We didn't have the power really to do the things that we needed to do if we were going to stay free. An entire community of nations were looking at us like a redheaded stepchild at the card table. Okay, We were never going to get any respect because we didn't really have a government. I think that what they did was wonderful. But they did, and this is just an historical fact, they did go beyond their mandate. They were told to propose amendments to the Articles of Confederation. They did exactly that. They amended the entire document with a brand new document. The Articles of Confederation, by the way, in Article 13, required 100% unanimous decision of all of the state conventions to, um, to, to accept any amendment to the Articles of Confederation. But Article 7 of our United States Constitution changes that. <coughs> that if only nine states, the ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution. So we have a modern day convention of states, Article 5 convention, constitutional convention, pink, twinky, whatever we decide to call it, we have one. Can they propose an entirely new method for ratifying whatever changes or whatever new document they produce? Do they have the moral authority to do it? And that's a tricky one, because if they don't, then neither did George Washington and James Madison. So if we find ourselves in a sticky spot here, unless we're willing to admit they not only have the moral authority to do it, the Declaration of Independence itself says that whenever any form of government is displeasing to any people's purpose of happiness, they ought to just throw it away and start a new one. It's exactly what our founding fathers did in 1787. I'm glad they did it. I think the document they produced is a wonderful thing. I hear people say, well, Mitch, we've got to do something. And I hold up the Constitution and I say, Show me the deficiency of this document that needs to be addressed. Well, but Congress, that's not in this, that's not this document's fault. I've got teenagers. I set curfews. I make rules. They don't abide by them. I don't give them a piece of paper and a pen and ask them what they think the rules ought to be. <laughs> we, we have a come to Jesus meeting is what happens in my house. And you know what? We don't need to amend the Constitution. We need to amend those politicians that won't abide by the Constitution. Yep. Get right or get out. Replace them with somebody that will do it. Go to work and find those candidates that have a record, by the way, of doing this. And I'm not talking about the 2010 Tea Party or 2008 Tea Party Revolution where we got John Boehner. <coughs> Sorry, guys, we all drank the Kool-Aid on that one. We need to forgive ourselves and move on, okay? But it is what it is. And we find these men and women of integrity who have a record of holding the line. And I don't care about party affiliation, and probably none of you do either, okay? It's about the person and their integrity, not the party that they're affiliated with. So, we introduce ratification method number three, yet unknown. We have no idea what this method would be. It doesn't exist yet. But neither did the idea that three-fourths of the states would have to when they wrote the Constitution we've got now. So a reality is, they could write, not maybe not a whole new constitution. It's, it's entirely possible, but let me pull up short and try to sell you something easier than that. Just sweeping changes. You don't have to get rid, by the way, of the Fourth Amendment. Just add four or five words to it. When in service of the government, when in service of the militia. And now all of a sudden, Mitchell Shaw doesn't have a right recognized by his government to own or maintain a firearm. Why? I've got the right. Give it to me, my God. But you know what? In every third world dictatorship, those people have the same rights given to them by God. But they don't have a constitution that protects it, recognizes it, and allows it. So we're not talking about where rights come from. Rights come from God. And in the absence of the Fourth Amendment, I'd still have the right to keep and bear arms. My government just, I'm sorry, the Second Amendment. I apologize. I actually know the Constitution. Illegal search and seizures. Fourth Amendment, too. So in the absence of the Second Amendment, I've still got the right to keep and bear arms. 
I just don't have a government that recognizes that. So they introduce sweeping changes, and then they change the method of ratification. So let me throw a scary one at you folks. What, how legitimate would it be if that method of ratification was simply that both houses of Congress approve it, yeah. and the president signs off on it, like every other law? Is that legitimate? Sure, it could be considered so. We elected those people, they're there to represent us, and that's all they would be doing. And an entire world full of nations would look at that document as if it were completely legitimate. And there'd be nothing we could do about it, because it would be the law of the land. So let's look at the claims of those advocating a modern-day constitutional convention or convention of states. They say the states can bypass Congress in the amendment process. Is that what Article 5 says? Well, let's take a look here. The state legislatures can apply, and if they're so fortunate as to be part of the ratification process, they get to be involved in the ratification process. According to the text of Article 5, the state legislatures have done their job. They applied, and then Congress gets to decide whether they have any further involvement in the ratification process. Congress calls the convention, makes rules for the convention, and gets to choose the method of ratification. So does it look like we're bypassing Congress in this process? No. Congress is not bypassed. According to Article 5, Congress is the one who gets to throw the party. They get to choose the invite list. This is their party, folks. They say states can propose amendments. Well, the convention proposes the amendments. That's in Article 5. So I can wish that the states could propose amendments. But is it true? And does wishing make it so? No, the states don't get to choose the amendments. We can talk about whatever we want to talk about before an Article 5 convention is thrown. But when that 34th state puts in their call, and we've ironed out all the details, and the invite list is out there, what Article 5 says is that Congress shall call. Congress shall call a convention uh, for proposing amendments. The convention proposes the amendments. When will they do that? During the convention. Now, folks, this isn't 1787. Thomas Jefferson isn't going to send a whole, book, a whole bunch of books to James Madison for him to study and go over before this happens. George Washington's not going to chair this thing. Okay? That's not going to happen. Yes, sir? Uh, Two-thirds of the several states can propose a uh, convention, right? Can apply for the convention. Okay, now, I know this is a fact for prohibition. I studied a little bit about how prohibition got passed. Okay. And it was one guy that had a brainstorm. He knew he could not do this by going through Congress. So what he did was state by state, until he got the requisite number of states to propose to Congress for the constitutional amendment. And then, and then of course, it had to be ratified after after Congress. But but the method was that two thirds of each house passed it at the, at the federal level, and then it went to the states. Right, because he had counted heads. He knew how many states were willing to sure. go ahead and do it. So when he went to his congressman and said, do it, hey, I've already done the math for you. It's going to pass. You're pushing it an open door. But the method that was used there is the first method that they passed, uh, let's see, the congressman over two-thirds of both houses shall be necessary. So two-thirds of both houses passed this. It passed by a supermajority right. vote and then went to the states for ratification and was easily ratified. Because of the state special, special conventions. Vote. Right. Because the states first came up, we sure. got 34. No, well, the same, many, same, 34. same thing happens all the time when we go to the state legislature and say, for instance, hey, there's this federal law that I think is nonsense, and the state legislature, who has no direct power to set aside that law, we'll talk about that in a moment, but for right now they have no direct power to set aside that law, but instead they will say, well, as a governing body of the state of Virginia or South Dakota or Florida or wherever, we're going to commemorate Congress to get rid of this law. We're going to say to Congress, look, we talked to our voters, the same people who elect you. And this is a bad law and it ought to go away. Does that set the law aside? No. But if enough states do that, then the federal guys who know that, oh, by the way, those are the same people that vote for me or don't vote for me, start, sort of wake up and pay attention. And then they say, well, you know, we probably ought to take a look at that thing. Because their heart's in the right place, 
No, because their fingers in the air and they know which way the wind is blowing. And got, that's how we get something done. And it doesn't require a constitutional convention or even an amendment to the Constitution to make that happen. We can take the Constitution exactly as it is written, begin applying it, and see a difference. Or we can take a really risky chance at opening up the Constitution to sweeping changes through an amendment convention that we are not sure we can control and I am sure we cannot. So let me, let me get back to this then. So they say states can make the rules for calling a convention. In fact, in this last legislative session, there were six bills before the Virginia state legislature addressing Article 5 convention, convention of the states, constitutional convention. A lot of different language was used in all six of the bills. Two of those six bills were procedural bills. How would we go about choosing delegates in the event that we have an Article 5 convention? Well, the state of Virginia can decide whatever it wants to about how she would go about choosing delegates. But the text says that Congress has the authority to make all rules and laws regarding the Constitutional Convention because it is one of those things over which Congress has authority. If Congress is involved in it, if it's their function to have a convention, they have the authority to choose the rules. And it won't really matter what Virginia decided a year ago or last year or next year. It's not going to matter. What's going to matter is what does Congress decide to do about this? So let's take a look at that. They say it's not a constitutional convention. It's much more limited in power. Let's look at the limits that are placed in Article 5 on what can and cannot be discussed at a convention. Provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1888 or 808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article dealing with the importation of slaves. So it's a non-issue any longer. We don't import slaves anymore. So it's gone. No need to discuss it. And that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. And we could be here all night, by the way, talking about the 17th Amendment. I'm not going to do that. But let us just say that that is now a moot point, at least for the time being. So, what other restrictions are placed in Article 5 on what can or cannot be discussed by the convention? It's an open box. It's Pandora's box. They discuss anything they want to. And they have the moral high ground of going to the convention in 1787, which did exactly that. So they can say, oh, we're going to balance the budget. This is just, we're just going to discuss a balanced budget amendment. But the day that gavel comes down and they convene, they get to make their own rules. Congress makes the rules for holding a convention. The convention is going to make their own rules for what they discuss. It's the only precedent we've got. <clears throat> so it's not more limited in power. It's exactly a constitutional convention. They say state voting power is going to be one state, one vote. Let me entertain that for a moment. OK, it is one state, one vote. I'm about to prove that it's not. But let's just imagine that it is. That doesn't allay my fears my concerns for one moment. What if it is one state, one vote? And then they say, well, do the math. That's, that's one of their favorite expressions. Do the math. Look at the math. Red state versus blue state. Well, how many red states have legislatures that pass nonsense bills through their own legislatures every year? How many red states write bills that violate to some degree or another, the federal constitution or their own state constitutions. Oh, that never happens, right? So they throw them up there to see if the Supreme Court will strike it down. Well, since the Supreme Court doesn't hear every little thing that comes along, they get to decide what they hear and don't hear. Them not striking it down isn't the same thing exactly as them saying it's okay, but in practice, it's exactly the same thing saying it's okay. They just say, no, we're not even going to look at it. And then it stands. So I do the math. And I'm not looking at red versus blue. Because folks, I came a long time ago to realize that distinction is not clear enough for me. Maybe I'm just colorblind, but when it comes to politics, I'm pretty colorblind. Red state, blue state, I don't even know what you're talking about. But when I look at the map, what I want to see is which state legislatures turned down Obamacare money. 
which is the state legislature sought, sought to strike down unconstitutional laws from being enforced in their states. Not many. I mentioned Senator Randy Brogdon earlier. He ran for governor while I was there, and Mary Fallon uh, beat him out in the primary. She outspent him by seven times and beat him out by a few hundred thousand votes. So he ran a pretty good race. But when he was state senator, he was working really hard to expose the Trans-Texas Corridor, which if, if any of you followed the old plans for a North American Union, it was supposed to be up and running by 2010. It's not. They missed their mark because it was exposed by good men like Senator Randy Brogdon in Oklahoma. Okay? Write his name down, Randy Brogdon. Google this guy. You'll find videos of him addressing the North American Union. In one of those, he said, speaking of uh, the governor of Texas, he said, how many of you have ever been to Texas, by the way? Okay, great. Oh, this is wonderful. I tell this story all the time. Nobody knows what a Texas turnaround is. The way their whole highway system is there, it's wonderful. You don't have to, like, get off at an exit and do the whole cloverleaf thing to get back. <clears throat> Under all the bypass or overpasses, they just got an inside turn lane. You just make a U-turn and you're headed back the other way because I missed my exit. No big deal. Love it. So he says, he says, if the Texas governor thinks he's going to build Trans-Texas Corridor 35, TTC 35, right through Oklahoma City, he's got another thing coming. He's going to have to big, build the biggest Texas turnaround you've ever seen because that thing's not crossing the Red River. Okay, the reporter raised his hand and said, well, well Senator Brogdon, um, what are you going to do if they withhold our highway funds? You're elected governor, and you say we're not going to build the highway, so they say we're going to withhold your highway funds. He said, well, maybe you don't understand the way this works. See, we collect those funds and the taxes when you buy a loaf of bread or a gallon of gas or whatever. Okay, Then we remit those taxes to the federal government who keeps a portion of it, sends the rest of it back to us like it's some kind of Christmas present. He said, if they mess with me, I just won't remit the taxes. What are they going to do? Live on CNN, come down here with armored personnel carriers and rob yes. the state capitol? No. No. <laughs> okay? That's what it's going to take. It's going to take that kind of attitude that says, you know what? You don't have the constitutional authority to do what you're doing anyway, and you can do it everywhere else, and they'll allow it, but you're not going to do it in my state. That's what it takes. Yeah. So one state, one vote, even if it were true, it wouldn't help my mind one bit on this. But to put it for what it's worth, Colin, it's not true. The Congressional Research Services, which we've got some materials over here talking about Congressional Research Services, referring to the 41 bills introduced by Congress, by the way, because, you know, we always think Congress doesn't know what they can do. They know what they can do. They just don't care most of the time, okay? It's not that they're blind or ignorant to their power. They're just getting paid very well to not act in certain areas. But they know, looking at the text of the Constitution, who has authority over this thing, and there have already been 41 bills introduced, setting in place, by the way, the rules for how such a convention would be carried out. Regarding those 41 rules, Congressional Research Services reports to Congress, apportionment of convention delegates among the states was generally set at the formula provided for the Electoral College, with each state assigned a number equal to its combined Senate and House delegations. So as bad as one state, one vote would be, it's worse than that, folks. Congress has already decided it's not going to be one state, one vote. It's going to be along the Electoral College. The large states, the really liberal states on the left coast, are going to have more votes than you've got. Billy has more toys than you. It's just a fact. So, it's not true. What about other dangers? <clears throat> well, let's take a look at unintended consequences. Let's imagine they get together with the very best of intentions. They do their very best job. Is it possible something could go wrong? Is there a person in this room who still thinks it's okay to treat black people like they're not full citizens? No. No. The 14th Amendment did a wonderful job of saying, hey, it doesn't matter if last year you were a slave, today you are a full citizen of the United States with all of the rights and privileges that every other citizen of the United States has. That's the 14th Amendment. But by the time we're done with it, through judicial redefining, you get birthright citizenship, regardless of legal status. You get 
homosexual marriage being read into it. You get 100,000 other things that are nowhere in the text of Article 4 or of the 14th Amendment. But the judges have redefined it through their decisions. An unintended consequence. The 14th Amendment was a good thing. It serves a great purpose. It's just being used to serve other purposes that it was never intended to serve. Agendas that it was not written for. Let's look at undisclosed intended consequences because it won't be news to you folks that there are evil people in the world that have evil plans that they sneak around in the dark to try to carry out. I will submit for your approval the 16th and 17th Amendments. The American people were lied to, but Congress was not deceived. This was not an unintended consequence. They fully intended to tax your labor to death. Mm -hmm. That was their plan to fund their new world order, to fund their war machine, to fund their agenda. It was a fully intended but undisclosed consequence. Could either of these things happen with modern amendments? Now, if it's just the folks in this room that are going to sit down and talk about what ought to be done, I'm a lot more comfortable. But it's not going to be folks. It's going to be special interests. It's going to be corporations. It's going to be political interests and partisans from every corner of America. And they're not going to be able to do it in the year 2014 the way they did, or 2016 or 2018, the way they did it in 1787, close the doors and windows and keep private. Which was wise, by the way. Because at some point, George Washington will have expressed an opinion over and over and over about how things ought to be done. And then he's going to have to concede. And then he's going to have to go back out in the public eye and still be George Washington that everyone respects. So, we're going to keep our proceedings secret. We're going to take notes, but until 50 years after the last of us die, we're not going to release those notes. Now, I'm comfortable with that bunch doing it. Who's comfortable with it being done in secrecy today? So it's live on CNN. You can stream it on the web. How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? What's it going to produce? Will the conservatives cave on those issues the way they cave on everything else? Because they say do the math. I looked at Obamacare and I did the math. If Republicans had stuck to their guns, the darn thing wouldn't have passed. We got sold out. Can we afford to get sold out when it comes to the text of the Constitution? I, I, can't, I can't place that bet. I can't just put it all on Black 13 and spin the wheel and hope for the best folks. And I don't think you can either. 13 is black, right? Never, never been this. <laughs> so what's the root of the problem? Is it flaws in the Constitution? How about ignoring the Constitution? Can we all buy into that one for a moment? How about ignorance of the Constitution? Yes. You know, Bob Marshall, in his debate last week, uh, Mr. Ferris, pointed out a particular politician who had ascended to the high office of the U.S. Congressman. And he goes to this guy and he says, You've got this uh, situation here you know, where the Supreme Court keeps deciding on these issues, and I think you ought to restrict your appellate jurisdiction over this particular issue. Maybe leave it alone. The guy goes, We can't do that. Bob walks right over the guy's own bookshelves, roots around for a second, pulls off a book, flips it up, and shows him. Not only can you do it, but it's been done bunches of times. Congress absolutely has the right and the authority and the power to restrict the Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction over any issue they want to. Yes. They wrote it into Obamacare, by the way. So they know they can do it, but how many of them don't know they can do it? So we talk about constitutional ignorance, by the way, and we're always talking about them. Let's look at the person in the mirror for a second. You know where the real problem is, folks? It's not on Capitol Hill. That's a symptom. We only know we're sick because we have a fever, but the fever isn't the problem. The virus is the problem. You can reduce your fever all you want to, but unless you deal with the problem, it's going to crop back up. Okay? So the real problem is not on Capitol Hill. The real problem is at your job, and it's at your church, and it's in your neighborhood, and sometimes it's in your mirror. Okay? We've got to be diligent, or we are not going to save this country. And radical ideas that are far sweeping and might save everything, you know what I like in this too, by the way? I don't know if y'all know the economy's rough, okay? So imagine some poor guy who's three months behind on his house payment, 
And he knows as long as he makes that payment every month, he stays 90 days behind. And the bank's going to keep hassling him, but they're not going to come and put tape over his door. But the next payment is, is they're just going to get a red. They're going to put him out in the street. They're going to auction off his house after he's there with the grass growing his eyes and windows. Because that's the way they do it. I don't understand it. Okay? So what does he do? Well, he hatches a plan. I know I can only stay ahead so long, but eventually I'm going to throw a tire, blow a transmission. Something's going to happen. The dog is going to get sick. I'm not going to be able to make that month's mortgage payment. When I don't, they're going to take my house. So, he says to his wife, Honey, I got it all sorted out. Got my paycheck today. $1,385. And I went down and I bought 1,385 lottery tickets. I've got this thing in the back. Because <laughs> one of them's going to hit, baby. And we're probably not even going to buy, pay off this house. We're just going to go buy us an island. Live the big life. His wife's happy, right? <laughs> no, she's crying herself to sleep tonight because she knows tomorrow that mortgage payment's not getting made. Those lottery tickets are not going to hit, but they might. One of them might. He only needs one of them. 1,385 of them, folks. That's the risk we're taking here. We cannot afford it. Could it work? Am I crisp in the mind reader and I can guarantee you this won't happen? You know what? It could happen. It could happen. Pigs could fly, too, but they're not going to. And we could lose everything to this plan. Thomas Jefferson said, If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. So part of the solution is to create an informed electorate. See, they hear us say that, and they repeat it back to us as if we've said, well, just elect better people. It's not what I said. What I said is, create an informed electorate. Realize that the most important part of the voting process is the voter, not the candidate. Candidates come and go. And as Boehner taught us, they'll look you right in the face and lie to you about their principles, about their agenda, about their plan, and then they'll do what they were going to do anyway. Yeah. Because they're counting on an uninformed electorate who doesn't understand the nuts and bolts behind it, forgetting about it before two years or six years or four years passes. That's what they're counting on. Develop a really long memory and learn to carry a grudge. And when your congressman sells you out, decide that day that no matter what he does moving forward from here, he doesn't get the job again. Okay? And I'll tell you a brief story from history. David Crockett, some of you may know this story, is published in several different forms. But David Crockett, when he was holding office, as a congressman from Tennessee, was getting ready for re-election. So he goes, man, nobody's running against him, but it makes sense to go stomp. So he does, and he finds a guy, I think his name was Forrest Munts or Bunce, there in uh, Tennessee. Fairly influential, people like this guy, know what he's got to say. So he goes to him, he says, Mr. Munts or Bunce, I'd really love to have your support in the upcoming election. The man says, no, sir. I can't do it, and in fact, if anybody runs against you, I'm probably going to put my support behind him. <gasps> Why is that? He said, well, in the last legislative session, you voted on an unconstitutional bill, and that shows me that you either have, that you either lack the knowledge or the integrity to carry forth the duties of your office. And then he reversed himself. He said, you know, I don't think it's a matter of integrity. I actually think you've got integrity, but because of your lack of knowledge, that makes you all more dangerous because you're just putting in the hands of other people. Tell me what you're talking about. I don't think we even voted on any constitutional bills last time. So low was his level of understanding. And he says, the fire in Georgetown, a bunch of houses burned down. Do you remember that? He said, I sure do. Women and children were left homeless because of it. And we voted for an appropriation of funds to $20,000 to rebuild those homes. It's a Christian thing to do. And Buck says, it would have been, had it been your money to give. But since the Constitution neither stipulates nor defines charity, it's not a function of the federal government. They have no business messing with it. And you were wrong to touch it in the first place. You feel bad for those people, give them your own money. The people of Georgetown were glad to see you pass that bill because it alleviated them of their moral responsibility to follow the law of Christ and do something about it themselves. They were glad to have the whole nation robbed of $20,000 and not even be able to see the source of their robbery. Crockett was struck by this. He said, sir, you're right. And if I get elected, he said, I will personally repudiate that vote. 
I'll stand up publicly and tell everybody I was wrong, and I'll never do it again. If I get reelected, I'll follow through on this. So once throws a barbecue, get a bunch of people together, Crockett goes around telling everybody what a jerk he was. Oh, look what I did. Well, that was terrible. I'll never do it again. He gets reelected. In the very next legislative session, turns out that some uh, admiral in the War of 18, 1812, War of 1812, often dies, because people do that when they get old, and he left his wife without a thing. So Congress gets together to decide about what we ought to do. Concerning our debt to this great man, everybody's willing to vote for it because you can't have some war widows or some war heroes widow living in a ditch somewhere. Just can't happen. Crockett stands up, everybody expects him to support it. He says, not only can I not support it, but I want to tell you why. And he told him all the story I just told you. He said, it's not ours to do, folks. And if it is ours to do, we've got to do it from our own money. And I'm the poorest man in this Congress, but I'll personally give that woman one week's pay. And if every man in this room who decides to vote for this bill would do that instead, why the money we would raise would be greater than what we want to steal from the treasury. The bill was defeated. Why? Because one man took his congressman to task and made a sound argument. They didn't call him names and kick him in the shins. He just informed him. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free and expects what never was and never will be. <laughs> Folks, I've got a dirty word. I don't like to use this kind of language in front of women and children. Four little words ought to be left on the street. Work. <laughs> we're going to have to work if we're going to do this. We can't sit around and wait for somebody with some hero with a plan to save America for us. It's not their America. It's yours and mine. If we're going to save it, we're going to have to walk the soles off of our shoes and pound our knuckles on strangers' doors, and we're going to have to call people during dinner time and disturb them during the Friends Marathon and just get the job done. You're going to have to put away your golf clubs. I'm going to have to put away, you know, I don't do anything. I don't know. I don't know. But I'll find something to put it away. And we're going to have to get busy because that's what it's going to take. Thomas Jefferson also said, educate and inform the whole mass of the people that are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. And another quote, he calls them the only safe depository. The people. Folks, present company possibly excluded. The politicians aren't going to save us. They're not. They're just, if they were, we wouldn't be in this mess. So the Constitution is the solution. States should enforce it, not revise it. Is there a single person in this room who actually believes that the deficiency exists in the document itself? Yeah. Or is it the adherence to the document? Okay. It's fair. I appreciate your honesty. It's an unpopular position. It, it takes a lot of integrity to say so. I value that. Okay? I don't hold that. Thing. I don't believe that the, the, the document is deficient. I believe the adherence is deficient. So how do we fix that? Yes, yes, ma'am. I don't think so. No. Is it on YouTube? Uh, no. And this is Lynn Kimber? Lynn Kimber. Lynn Kimber. No, I'll, I'll look it up though. Because his thing is, is that it's maybe in this young that feel right. Sure. That have created a problem that have actually given I, Congress. I have said for many years, I've said for many years, that the only modern day amendment I could get behind is one that repeals an existing amendment. It's not, it's not that we need to add to government power, for instance, okay? And again, folks, I'm, I'm not talking about integrity here. I'm not denigrating anybody. I'm just going to talk about information. Michael Ferris, along with all of the other things he does, including Convention of States, is also the founder and I think president of, he's at least the driving force behind parental rights.org. Now, parentalrights.org ostensibly exists to rein in the danger that is created by the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The proposed method for doing that is to write an amendment to the US Constitution that defines your rights and your position as a parent. Am I comfortable with that? Having the federal government that runs roughshod over everything to find my parental rights and then allowing federal judges to define that law that defines my parental rights? Hey, I say figure it out like it is, man. Leave it alone. Because an amendment by its very nature 
grants authority to the federal government to touch something that it previously did not have the authority to touch. Unless it is that rare bill, like repealing prohibition, we could use a few more bills like that. We'll start working our way backward. But before we get there, what do we do? Do we have a lot of laws on the books that there's no justification for in the federal constitution at all? I'm not about federal laws. I'm going to leave state laws out of this for a second because there are a lot of things the states are allowed to do that the federal government's not allowed to do, and that's by design, and I like it that way. But do we have laws on the federal books that don't have the first justification anywhere in the text of the Constitution? Yes. Absolutely. So what do we do about them? Well, Thomas Jefferson said what you do about them is you nullify them at the state level. Do you get to nullify a law just because you don't like it? No, if it's constitutional, you live with it, or you work to change it. But if it's not constitutional, whole departments of the government that exist, whole laws that are written that exist, hold them back. Now here's the value of this, okay? Today, that is painted as if it's this super radical approach, but it doesn't tinker with the Constitution. It leaves the Constitution intact. It just addresses laws that don't abide by the Constitution. Who believes really that the federal government ought to be more powerful than the state's governments? Nobody in this room. How about the state's governments having more authority within their own boundaries than the federal government does? Can we all raise our hands? Okay. That's a good one. The states book them. According to the paper, they do. In practice, they sure don't. In practice, the federal government treats the state boundaries like county lines within a state. I don't know when I pass from Louisa County into the next county. I'm just driving. I don't know when I pass from Alabama into Georgia unless I cross a river. Because the federal government makes it where there's virtually no difference. Because every state is supposed to be homogenized. We put them all in the blender and shake them up. I don't like blended scotch. I like a single malt. That's just me, okay? Just saying. And I don't want America to be one big blended thing. Every state ought to have its own identity. And if state legislatures would begin to use the purpose and the process of nullifying unconstitutional federal laws, let's just pick a new one. Let's take Obamacare. That's a great place to start. So what is the end result of nullifying that? Okay? If a dozen states nullify Obamacare, can it really be said to be a national thing anymore? No. So it falls apart. Because how are we going to fund it? And these 12 states, not only are 13 or 15 or 7 states, not only are not going to participate in it, they're not going to pay into it. They don't want the money, and their people don't want to be involved. It's done. It's done. It's dead in the water. Real ID is a perfect example of state nullification because states just refuse to abide by the standards that were set by Real ID. And in essence, it was killed. It's still on the books, but no one ever thinks we're going to put it into practice. No time soon, not unless they can get back to those state legislatures as new people are elected to those offices and get them to change their minds on this. As it stands, it's done. So once a state does that, let us just imagine that instead of working our guts out to try to open up the entire Constitution as we can change this, we took that same time, that same talent, that same treasury, and used it to convince our state legislatures, right here in Virginia, to just nullify Obamacare. Stand up. Act like men and women. Just do it. You know it's the right thing. You've got the authority. Exercise it. So they did. And then they sit down and they think, hey, there are a lot of other unconstitutional laws on the books. Why don't we tackle another one? And another one. And another one. And then other states see that happen. And they follow that pattern. This isn't pie in the sky, folks. It's been done before. It can be done again. If you've not read Tom Wood's excellent book on nullification, get it. The name of the book is Nullification. You decide to keep it simple so that everybody can find it in the bookstore or the library. Tom Wood's nullification. If you've not read it, read it. This is a real plan to save America. Create an informed electorate that will only elect people to office that have integrity and will stand by the principles that made America great in the first place, including the text of the Constitution. Okay? Well, but where are we going to get the politics? Where are the candidates? Going? They're going to rise up out of that informed electorate. They're going to rise up out of that pool that we create as we knock on doors, as we email our friends, as we make those phone calls. 
as we inform people, not, not just about issues. That's easy, folks. That's on the surface. We're not sitting on the skin. We've got cirrhosis. We've got to go deep to fix this thing. So we can't talk about just issues. We've got to talk about the principles behind those issues. Because when a person <clears throat> understands the principles, they're never going to ask you who to vote for again. They're going to figure it out on their own. They're never going to ask you how they ought to vote on this uh, bill or, or on that issue. They're going to know the answer. Their <laughs> principles are going to direct them because you help them find their principles. And then we pressure state legislatures to begin nullifying unconstitutional laws. And that doesn't take very long, folks. It takes getting a few of the right people in the state legislature position that will abide by this idea, won't pass unconstitutional laws at the state level, and refuses to let the federal government be the sole arbiter and interpreter of the Constitution. So my answer to this, and I know that I came here tonight with a very high bar to, to cross. I hope I've done that to at least some of your minds. My simple point is this. If we open the Constitution up to sweeping changes, we may lose what we've got left. And the fact, oh, but Mitch, it's already too late. Boy, we're already pretending right on the precipice. Uh, there are 60 people in this room right here writing about what their government's doing, and no one's shooting us. We've got, I saw you cross yourself earlier, I'm not trying to call you out. We've got Catholics in the room. I imagine we've got some Methodists and some Presbyterians. I can ask folks here, they don't really care for religion one way or the other. In a third of the nations in the world, when two people disagree about who or what God is, somebody's got to die. That's not happening in this room. Why not? Because liberty is alive. Because we can agree to disagree. Because it's not even that big of a deal. We can speak out against the actions of our government. I'm being videoed tonight. If anybody else wants to video this, if you want a copy of that video, all I ask is that you post it in total. Don't cut it to pieces and make me look like an idiot. I do that on my own. Okay? <laughs> you want to post this on the web? Post it on the web. I don't have a thing to hide. And we can do that in America. But it's too late. Folks, we are the change we need. We just have to do this. And changing the Constitution is not going to fix what's wrong with America because the Constitution is not what's wrong with America. So that's it for me. I'm glad to take any questions for the next few minutes. Yeah. So question and answer, I'm glad to. Thank you.
Why can't they be trusted to just man up or woman up? I don't want to be accused of misogynism here. Okay? Why can't they just cowboy up and get this thing done through nullification? Good question. And there's, the answer is they can. Yes, ma'am. So her question was, what about the governors of those states? So a state legislature attempts to nullify a particular law. Can the governor uh, veto that? Absolutely. It depends on, on, on how their yeah, depends on how the constitution is written. But I would imagine absolutely that she could. But here's the issue. Here's the issue. Those are going to be the same governors that are active in those same states that we're already talking about. If we can't, let me put it this way, if we can't nullify Obamacare, what makes us think we're going to write it out of existence by amendment? And that leads directly into my next question, which is the other part of our government we didn't address, which is the judiciary and the federal activist judges who create rights and laws and things out of whole cloth. <laughs> so, so I like to say the Constitution is the solution. And if we were only applying the tools that were given in the Constitution, we, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. So let's take a look at that for a second. We keep being told, by the way, that we have three co-equal branches. That's a fairly new idea. <clears throat> and it's a bald-faced lie. We don't have three co-equal branches. They really need you to think that all branches are equal. The easy way to judge this is just look at the text of the Constitution. Article 1, which, by the way, is first, not just numerically, but in importance creates the House and the Senate and is about this thing, a small one. Yeah, I carry a little lot. Three or four, five, six pages, okay? Article two creates the presidency and is about half that long. Why? Because he has fewer powers that needed to be spelled out. Article three, which creates the judiciary, is about two pages. Why? Because they don't really have that much authority. Not only that, Trick question for all of us in the room. How many positions or areas are created by how many, um, gosh, what is the word I'm looking for? Somebody jumping and save me. I look like an idiot. Uh, how many courts are created by Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution? One. One. And whatever inferior courts. Congress may from time to time establish and ordain. Every federal court that exists below the Supreme Court exists at the sufferance of Congress. And it doesn't even require, this is important, because <coughs> I keep being told that federal judges have a lifetime appointment. It's not what the Constitution says, it says well and good behavior. Wild and good behavior. <coughs> well, this just got easy. <laughs> Decides because they all stayed up late and didn't get a good night's sleep. They decided to do the right thing, okay? Because it would require sleep deprivation for that to happen in our current situation. But it does. They decide to do the right thing, and they start with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, God willing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't impeach a single judge. You don't get your day in court. You don't get a hearing. Your job's just been downsized. Bad economy. We don't need you anymore. Take your options. You're out of here. Your judgeship doesn't exist anymore because your court doesn't exist anymore. How many times would they have to do that before every other federal judge in America dusted off the Constitution and got in line with his job description? Once. That's the answer. How does that happen? Because that's a big answer. It's a long way away. Create an informed electorate who put pressure on their elected officials to abide by the Constitution. We don't elect judges, they don't answer to us, but they <coughs> darn skippy answer to Congress. And, and we the, do elect Congress. And the judges in the state are appointed by the legislature. So, so we have that same issue again. If you can appoint them, you can unappoint them. Not in other states. No, no, not, well, let's talk about Virginia. Because we all call it all that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, you mentioned the answer is an informed electorate. Yeah. And uh, I've heard many a speaker talk about we need to be formed elected for years. 
what is your plan to inform the electorate and how long do you think it's going to take in order to elect a number of day frat? Sure. And let's do the math on day frat. One, uh, established Republican was defeated this year in primary. Right. I don't know how many there were. That's okay. right. So, how many people do we need to change Congress? All of us. Well, you know, I don't know how many people, how many uh, politicians do we need to change Congress? Several hundred. Okay. So, well, okay, one, well, let me finish. One a year, several hundred. We're talking about several hundred years. So, my point is, and that's an exaggeration. Sure. I, I, it's going to take a really long time to inform the electors. So my, my question is, what is your plan, and how long do you think it's going to take? Yeah, how many of you write letters to the editor? Everybody raise your hand next time I ask that question. Just write letters to the editor. It's, it's not a hard thing to do. Write letters to the editor, call into local talk shows, talk to your friends and neighbors. How long does it take to create a formal electorate? Well, if we'd all get busy, it wouldn't take very long. And I'll give you an illustration of that. Gosh, what was his name? Um, Senator from oh, one of the Dakotas. Real progressives back in the 70s. I can't it doesn't matter. Google it. <laughs> I'm asking you, who? Anyway, very conservative state, very liberal politician. They were all too busy working to pay attention, working their guts out, doing the right thing. You see him off of Washington, and he comes home every so often. Has a barbecue, kisses a few babies, they send him back. I think he's passed all these really liberal bills, big spending bills. So a bunch of people, a couple of chapters of the John Birch Society up there, decided to expose this guy. They just thought, you know what, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna publish his voting record. <laughs> so they did. In every newspaper in his state, they published his voting record. And he found, yes sir. Uh, the informed electorate is important. How do you deal with the apathy that exists everywhere? Yeah. Well, it's outside of the 60 people in this room. Look at voter turnout. Look at apathy in general. How do you rev that up? Part of creating an informed electorate means finding out what people give a darn about in the first place. Right. And and I will confess, <laughs> I will admit, folks. The hard part of this, look, let me finish my story there. So we published his voting record. The, 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 these groups published his voting record. Gets himself thrown out of office. And he's asked like 20 years later, man, what happened? He says, the John Birch Society happened to me. I never could recover from, quote, what they did to me. What did they, they published his voting record. Nothing they said was untrue. Here were the bills. Here's an explanation of the bill. Here's how your guy voted on the bill. So, an informed electorate. How long does it take? It really depends on how busy we all get. But how much pain? I'm sorry? Depends on how bad the pain gets. Well, that's going to be part of it, and, and that's the part of the answer to your question. Okay? So, how do you overcome apathy? You know, and some people, you're not going to, because they really just don't care. You know, somebody said, my wife, my wife says I'm, I'm ignorant and apathetic. I don't know if that's true, and I don't care. <laughs> Another guy said, my wife says I'm insensitive, but what do I care what she thinks? So, <laughs> but, but ignorance and apathy are very difficult to overcome. Ignorance is easier because you can inform people. Apathy is really hard to inform an apathetic person, I'll grant you that. But the good news is the people who are really, really, really apathetic are too busy playing video games to do anything else. Okay? Most of them are voting for Democrats. Well, or not voting. Or not voting. I mean, voter turnout's ridiculous. <coughs> Folks, if, the, if we would overcome this, and find out what the person cares about, by the way, and I'm not talking about partisan politics, because everybody, here's the flippant uh, address that most people get. Oh, that's just politics. I don't really care about that. Love that. Because then, again, I'm a word nerd, so I'm about defining our terms. So I said, well, let's define politics. Can politics accurately be defined as Policies and laws enacted by elected officials that impact various parts of my life. Yeah. Well, now I want you to tell me, oh, that's just policies and laws that are enacted by elected officials that impact parts of my life. I don't care about that. <laughs> so when you say politics, hear what you're saying. 
reach people, find them at their level, get them to understand why this matters. Are you going to get all of them to understand it? No. But guys, they got brainwashed by somebody. Somebody got to them, and they got to them early. So, when I talk about an informed electorate, by the way, I don't think we need anything that resembles a majority. We just need a really active minority that knows how to address these issues. Uh, just a couple of things. I appreciate you. Uh, that was your last month on the other side of it. I appreciate you allowing the video. Oh, sure. It's not allowed the last month. There's no video. I don't know why, why that was. Secondly, I appreciate the Steve Party allowing the video. Oh, I meant to say that from the beginning, folks. I, I'm thrilled that you want to hear both sides of this issue. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed at how many people don't <coughs> want to do that. So tell me about the question. I recommend the, uh, the Tea Party. Oh, absolutely. Did you have uh, a question? Yeah, a couple of things I want to say there. I think you mentioned the states. They seem to focus on, you know, to me it's clear that part of the project, as you explain that, the states apply, and then you have a convention with those amendments. The convention of states kind of talks about, well, it has to be the same issue. did Charles Key. And so Charles Key turned out, you know, these guys who were standing up fighting the good fight, passing really wonderful bills to roll back the power of government at the state and federal level, and they're gone now because of term limits. Well, the last thing it's a double-edged sword, it's all I'm saying. The last thing I just want to say was, uh, there's been bills in over Virginia that's just taken sort of like one, one or two people to kind of get sure. a legislator to push this thing and then kind of spread the word on it. And he wasn't even getting, getting you know, all 500 of his nearest neighbors involved. Just getting something going to the legislator to get this thing in, in the hopper. And it's just a solid thing, that, and it grows from there. Yeah, so there's so, you know, just a few folks that do a lot, is what I'm saying. No, absolutely. I do. Nothing's ever been done by large groups. Nothing of any value. It's all been done by a handful of people who just decided to do it. Yes, sir? I didn't even see any debate between Bob Marshall and Mike Ferris, but I can know both of them.
Mike Curry said, I'll listen to him speak for an hour and a half today on this, and I'll listen to other people too. Um, but there has to be some authority. So where does the authority come from? I would say the authority is just the clear text of the Constitution. But you have to, yeah, but you got the Constitution law has actually been before the Supreme Court. Oh, God, the Constitution law. Oh, guys, guys, please. It's a fair question. question. One man that's a Constitution lawyer who has actually appeared before the Supreme Court on a number of cases and maybe one of the top Constitutional lawyers in the whole United States. That's now, fine. On your side, who is there somebody with that same statute that is supporting your petition? That's all. That's take what? Uh, a great number of constitutional lawyers, Edwin Vieira, for instance. Um, Google Edwin Vieira. He's, he's strongly against the idea of a constitutional convention, and he is a constitutional lawyer. But again, I mean, we've got, as somebody pointed out, Obama's a constitutional lawyer. That's really, no, 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 no it's, it, it's, it's valid. It's, it's a valid answer because it deals with where is the authority? Is the authority in someone's opinion regarding the Constitution? See, I'm an original constructionist. <coughs> and by that I mean, if I want to know what Article One of the Constitution means, I don't really care what some constitutional authority said yesterday or last year, 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Let me go back and read the Federalist Papers. What did they think it meant when it was being argued about whether or not they were going to pass it? When they had that opportunity to explain it, what did they say it would mean? How did they say it would behave? And I've got the texts, and they're available for free online. Go back and read the arguments of the Constitutional Convention. The texts are there. What does it mean? Why did they word it the way they did? Why did they phrase it this way? Why did they choose this phrase instead of that one? There's a reason behind it all. And so the greatest authority for all of this might be Madison himself, who within two years of 1787, it's 1790 or 1791, and he's being asked the question, should we do it again? Didn't we leave some loose ends? He said, uh -uh. guys, I sat through that last one. We don't ever need to do that again. I tremble, he said. And this is like the day and a half after that constitutional convention. He's like, no, guys, you have no idea. It's a freaking miracle we pulled this off like we did. We don't need to go messing with it. So there's an authority. But we don't have We get to you in a moment. You're exactly right. We've got we've got all these amendments that have been tacked onto the end of that wonderful document that weigh it down with nonsense. Sure, we've got some barnacles on the boat, but guys, it's a great boat. Right. Those are all amendments. No, no, I don't mean all the amendments. I mean recently. Well, would you would you attend the term limits on person? Yes, I would. Oh, I absolutely would. I think we, we didn't have term limits in the 1950s. And, and I think every president that we get now goes through the second term as a lame duck and spends four years paying off the, uh, the forces that, that put him in office to, to begin with because he, the people can't offer him a darn thing now. And patting himself for the next uh, post with the UN or some major corporation or building a speaking tour. That's a, tell me any president since term limits have been put into effect that has spent his second term serving the, the republic. Name one. Normally, that's when, that's when all the bad stuff comes out of what they did in the first term. So, so I would, to answer your question, but, but do I think that every yeah, amendment... only been one president to serve one of the two terms. But do I think that, that all modern amendments are necessarily bad? No, I don't. But we've got some bad ones, and that's my point. So let's take a look at some of these things. Like her, her statement, her, if everyone didn't hear what she said, she said, but we don't have the Constitution of 1787. We've got a Constitution with all these new amendments as part of it. And that's exactly right. But if that's part of the problem, how does opening up an amendment process, why I'm just laying that thing wide open, how does that fix it? Well, how come historically that's never happened? What has never happened? That they throw in 10 amendments when one amendment was presented for a ratification. All okay. of a sudden it became a multiple. Ah, the reason is, because we've only ever used, since 1787, we've only ever used the first method. We've only ever used the method where two-thirds of each house passes the bill, and then it goes out for gratification of the legislatures and two-thirds of the several states. And as such, you don't wind up with more than was passed through the Congress being ratified by the states. That can't happen. 
but in an Article 5 convention, constitutional convention, convention of states, whatever, that can absolutely happen because we have no control whatsoever on what's going to pass through that convention. They could pass anything they wanted to. They could simply amend the Constitution as it's written. They could rewrite existing amendments. They could rewrite existing clauses. They could write a whole new Constitution. They've absolutely got the authority to do so and care if the danger of it. Please, please. Yes, please. Uh, one more question that you can talk to me afterward. Okay, so, so last question, ma'am. statement than a question. Everybody's seen that bumper sticker uh, about the Second Amendment. You can have it when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. Right. Until we treat the entire Constitution and Bill of Rights that way and, and use the eternal vigilance that Jefferson said we must do, how important is your liberty and the liberty of your children to you? That's the question. When he, he said it at the beginning. It's a come to, we're in a come to Jesus moment. Uh, of our country, and, and then we, it's us in the mirror. How important is our freedom? Okay, well said. A couple things. Glenn Allen Day, September 20th, sign up. We need people at three or multiple booths. Check out the Center for Self Governance. Check the courses. <coughs> CSG online. You can check it out. And Mitchell, thank you very much. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you.